So I have been advised by a very well-meaning, very well-integrated professional immigrant that I should change my name. I should, make, I should have a Canadian name because then I will find it harder, uh, easier uh, to get through to resumes, etc. And I have picked two names, Rita or Rosa. <laughs> but in the end, I can't do it. My name is so much part of my identity, handed down to be by my grandmother. It's as much a part of me as the color, as the color of my skin. And I guess we'll just have to learn to manage. But there have been breaks. Through volunteering at my daughter's childcare center, I have come to the attention of the executive director. She has watched me raise money for the center through small efforts like potlucks and palm reading, which I pretend I can do, but I can't. <laughs> she sees something in me that is, I, she sees it as something more valuable than Canadian work experience, and she has offered me a contract position. This is very exciting work. My job is to find money, organize events, and generally be a kind of odd job person. She's my first mentor, and she takes great pains to show me how things are done here, what to say, when, and more importantly, what not to say. So I remain yours somewhat dejectedly, but still in hope. Ratna Omipa. The next letter is written exactly 10 years after we arrived in Toronto, June 1991. Dear Canada, today it is exactly 10 years. I am happy to tell you that time is proving to be a great healer. Slowly but surely, we can see that our initial hardships will one day translate into a good life. The clouds have not entirely lifted. After six years of occupational exile, both my husband and I are not exactly in, but we're around careers that have a future, even though we have possibly lost the best working years of our lives. After first starting and then shutting down a small business, then gaining a foothold as a technician, my husband is finally employed as an engineer. I have been practical. I realized long ago that nobody in their right minds would want to learn German from an Indian in Toronto. <laughs> So with the help of my wonderful mentor, I have recreated myself and reinvented myself. And there have been other silver linings too. We are slowly but surely becoming part of a community, primarily through the children's schools. We are learning that it is not disrespectful to challenge the teachers and ask questions. In fact, there's a reverse result. The more you challenge and ask the teachers about your children, the better they seem to do. I've also become a really good friend of our local library. I borrow and read books and magazines, rent movies and music, watch other people learn English, look at senior citizens re reading their week old Italian newspapers, receive guidance on how to fill out my tax return. I take my daughter to music classes there. And every summer we compete in the reading competition. It, it occurs to me that it is in these public spaces and places, schools, libraries, parks, that we are more equal than in others. There are a few instances that stick out in my, in my memory as our critical first feelings of belonging. We have enrolled Ramona in a competitive gymnastics club in order to pull her away from the TV. Even though I have no understanding of the sport, which is about ribbons and twirling and clubs and stuff like that, I spend most Saturdays hauling a variety of children to remote, strange locations all over small town Ontario like Aurora and Trenton and Chatham for competitions. And with other mothers, I make coffee and sandwiches and a very strange Canadian culinary confection called peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I think it is these experiences of collectivism, raising money, making sandwiches, planting bulbs in the neighborhood, finding similarities across our differences that join us in a society that to me seems highly individualistic and where the rights of the individual are primary. I have taken another very important step, looking at my own experience and that of my other immigrant friends. A group of us have come together to do something about the wasted time and talent of immigrants. We have collectively developed a proposal to provide employment counseling for immigrants so that those who come next will not face the disappointment and waste of time that we have. We have drafted a plan, we have met with people, in the community, we have met with public servants, we have met with members of parliament who have made noises of encouragement, and they have told us it does not fit their 
their uh, criteria because they can only fund issues of structural unemployment. So then I read up what structural unemployment is. And then I go back and I say, you know, I, I think this is an issue of systemic structural employment. And, and I must say it was wonderful because they listened. And I didn't know if they were going to say yes or no, but I was impressed by the fact that they listened. All the paperwork is done, and we wait now with bated breath for the results. And lo and behold, they find $75,000 somewhere. That was a lot of money, by the way, those days, to set up this new organization. And I begin to learn about a whole new set of responsibilities, setting up a board, being the chair, hiring an executive director. We found a church basement on Dundas West. An ex-Catholic priest is our first executive director. He was very good. And we are now providing employment counseling to a steady stream of new immigrants. There is someone from that organization here today. It's called Access now. We used to call it Downtown Employment Services. Today, it has, I believe, 140 staff and provides employment counseling to more than, I don't know how many thousand people. So this is wonderful. But then I learned this is not enough. Now we have to raise more money and we have to apply for United Way funding. So this has been a steep but very wonderful learning curve. The best part, though, of these past 10 years is that in 1987, I became your loyal citizen. You gave me another piece of paper this time, much more formal, that declared to all and sundry that I was a member of your family. And now I can officially call myself Canadian. It is a strange sensation to become a part of a family, even though there are very few blood ties. I have taken this step seriously. I have bought a number of books on your history. I have spent time with a citizenship teacher. I have learned about the Plains of Abraham and the early years of the Confederation. And I know the names of all the 10 provinces and the three territories. I do. I also know now that this path from exile to belonging has been shared by thousands who came before me and will be shared by thousands who will come after me. I have read about the cold weather farmers from the Ukraine who came to Canada in 1913 to settle the West, about the British orphans who were sent to Canada after the Second World War, about the Chinese who came to build the railroad, about the Ugandans who found refuge here after being expelled from their country, about the boat people from, from Vietnam, about the Italians who thought they were coming to the land of gold, about the Portuguese, the Chileans, and the Argentinians, wave after wave of people, all in search for a better life. I think each, in a sense, a refugee, just arriving in different times from different places. So now I feel, in a small way, part of this history, and I'm able to find an emotional connection with those who came after me and those who came before me. Knowing what I do know now of you, Canada, I wonder how you do this, how you keep your soul and share it with all those who do not have a common history with you. What makes you so translucent, so willing to define and redefine your identity? And I wonder if this is not a huge problem. The answer, of course, is no. This is not a problem. It is, in fact, the answer that allows us to be, as Pico Aya says, a global soul in a global place. I look at my two children, who are a strange and wonderful mix of the many cultures in their lives, Indian, Iranian, German, Canadian. They identify with all their identities, but they are mostly Canadian. I rejoice in the freedoms they take for granted, especially as young girls. They question everything, especially authority, especially mine. <laughs> they are just as comfortable, I know, eating hot dogs and sushi, they like to cheer baseball and cricket. They watch Bollywood and Hollywood. I know when they are old enough, they, they will date and marry and hang out with people from all backgrounds. I know when they go to work, they will work aside, Koreans, Americans, Chinese, and Japanese. And I know that in most likelihood, their boss will be a woman. 